So for today's class, uh, we are still now working further up the stack in the, um, in the database system. And now we're going to talk about how we do query execution and scheduling. So there's all this sort of background information we have to get to before we can understand why the, the hyper guys did what they did or why they chose that, that particular type of architecture. So I want to start off talking about different process models for in our database system, and then we'll talk about how to do query parallelization, what the different types of query parallelization you can have. We'll also talk about data placement, uh, non-uniform memory access models, and other things like that. Then we'll finally get to talk about scheduling, and then we'll finish up with a quick overview of a outline of rules you should follow when you're in the streets and when you're doing databases, and we'll be following a 1997 list of, of sort of edicts called the 10 Crack Commandments, and we'll go through that and we're just going to see how that relates to database systems and your life. Can, when you leave CMU, these are some of these life skills you need to, need to be able to have to survive. Okay, so when we, for the, pretty much for this entire semester, or the, the, or the entire semester, we're talking about a certain kind of database that's called a multi-user multi database system. And this differs from an embedded database system, something like SQLite or RocksDB or LevelDB, because um, in those systems, you assume that there's only one user accessing the database at a time. That user may want to run multiple transactions, but you're really only uh, trying to interact with sort of one, you know, one outside entity. So now in a multi-user architecture, in order to make sure we use the same terminology in our discussion for this lecture, I want to go through what at a high level when I, what I mean when I say a multi-user multi database application stack. So the term I'm going to use is that we have a client and the client interacts with the database server, right? So the client is actually not actually a client like an end user on their iPhone or doing something, right? This is like your application server running PHP, Node.js, Tomcat, or whatever it is. And it's making requests either in, in SQL or PL SQL over JDBC or ODBC or some other wire protocol to invoke queries on the, the actual database system itself. And then we differentiate the client between the end users, because the end users are sort of one hop removed. Uh, and these are the things that are going to be making invocations to the application server or the client, which then makes requests to the database server. So typically, these end user applications will be written in something like uh, you know, using like a REST API or a SOAP API, some kind of XML JSON thing. And you could be sending the request over, over HTTP. So another way to think about it is this is the front end application, right? This is the thing that sort of makes a high-level request about what they want the application to do. And then we have the back-end application that takes those requests and then converts them or, or executes the appropriate SQL statements against our database server to do whatever it is the operation that, that we, we want to do. Right? So when I say client-server as we go along, I really mean this setup. I don't mean this part over here. Some database systems, like CouchDB, can let you do like JSON requests or REST requests directly to the, the database system. But usually, this is how people always implement it. There's always an application layer uh, that is uh, you know, talking directly to the database server. Usually, you don't let them do that. OK, so to go further, I want to talk about the terminology we want to use uh, when we talk about query execution and query scheduling in a database system. So we're going to say a query is comprised a, of a query plan. Like you take a SQL statement and you generate a relational algebra query plan. And that query plan is going to be comprised of operators. And these could be relational operators like the scan, the join, uh, insert, update, delete, things like that. But also sort of these physical operators that allow us to have control flow in our, in our query plan. And we'll see what it looks like in a second. And the key difference is that, we, the key thing we have to understand is that when we have a query plan with a bunch of operators, all right, at a logical level, there'll be sort of you know, one scan operator for the one table we want to scan. But at runtime, the physical plan could have multiple instances of those operators that correspond to the same functionality being executed or in, in the logical operator, but being done in parallel on different segments of, of the data. All right, so we'll say a single operator can have multiple operator instances when we actually run the query. And then we're going to organize a, a sequence of operator instances into what are called tasks. Right? And this could be a, a, a series of operations that we're going to want to do to compute some portion of the query. And so all our scheduling, for the most part, is going to be at sort of the task level. 
right? That's the encapsulation we want to care about. And the idea is that if there are, are operator instances that sort of feed into each other one after another, we can combine them together into a single task and get sort of a, a nicer pipeline, better cache locality, because we know that the output of one operator can go directly and be used immediately by the next, by the next operator instance. OK. So now, if we want to support a multi-user application, we want to support multiple transactions, multiple queries running at the same time, we need to talk about what the database system's process model is going to be. And the process of the model is it's going to define the high-level architecture of how it's going to allow for concurrent operations in the system. Um, and then within this, this process model, we're going to have this notion of a worker. And I'll use the term worker thread throughout the, the lecture. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a thread, right? It could be, it could be a single process itself. Um, but the idea is that this worker is this high-level construct that is responsible for taking the tasks that the query planner will generate uh, in our physical plan and actually executing them and generating some results. And those results could either be fed into another task or they could be fed back to the, the client itself the, the, on the uh, application server. So I'm going to go through the three different process models we can have in our database system. Uh, for, as far as I know, all the database systems that are out there, we have to implement one, one of these three approaches. So the first model is called a process per worker. Uh, and the idea is that every single worker is going to execute as its own separate operating system process. So not a thread, but an actual, an actual you know, full-fledged process. And so what will happen is when the application sends a request, it will first go to this dispatcher. And the dispatcher will say, all right, let me fork off a process. Uh, that's going to handle the, this client connection. So it finds a worker, assigns the connection to, to that, that process, and now this worker will, will communicate directly with the, with, the, with the application on the client. Right? So when additional requests come in, it doesn't go through the dispatcher. It goes directly to this process. And then the worker knows how to interact with whatever the database is. Right? It could be on disk, it could be on memory, it doesn't matter. Um, so the way we're going to do scheduling in this process model is that we're going to completely rely on the operating system. Right? So we're, we're going to fork off a bunch, of, a bunch of processes and then let the OS scheduler do whatever it is it wants to do with them. Right? We can set priorities, you know, set the nice flag or IO nice for our worker threads, but we don't really have a lot of fine-grained control on how we set priorities in our system. Right? We just let the OS do whatever it wants to do. In order to make this work also in, in it, when we have multiple processes is that uh, for shared data structures like a lock table or even the you know, in-memory database itself, we have to use shared memory uh, and maintain locks and latches and do all the protections we would normally do in a single process environment in a multi-process architecture um, because we want to be able to, them to access, you know, we want all our threads, if we're using a buffer pool, we want all the processes to be able to you know, share that data and not have complete copies of everything redundantly. So this is the, this is the approach that was most used in the systems that came out of the 18, no, sorry, not 1890s, 1980s and 1990s, because back then, threading support was not what it is now, right? Now everyone has Linux, right? And there's pthreads and things are great. And for the most part, although there's different distributions of Linux, all right, everything's all so you know, GNU, everything's all POSIX. So your code is, is somewhat portable, pretty portable. Uh, back in the 1980s, 1990s, there was all these different variants of Unix, right? There was Solaris, there was HPOX 264, uh, Minix or whatever, all these other uh, Unix or BSDs, all these other variants of Unix that didn't have the same threading support or the same threading packages. So you could re reliably, uh, you, could, you could assume that your database, your, whatever operating system you were running on could support fork and do a multi-process architecture. But if you had to do threading, then chances are, if you wrote it for one operating system, it probably wouldn't work on another one. So you sort of limit your, your portability. So again, this is why things like you know, DB2, Postgres, and Oracle, all these older systems are using this architecture here. Another approach is, is to use, again, multi-processes. But instead of sort of forking off one process per client connection, what you can do is have a pool of worker processes so that when a request comes in, the dispatcher just picks some free process in a pool, lets it handle that one task it wants to execute, and that task could be you know, the entire query plan or could be a portion of it. It communicates to the database uh, itself and then sends the result back to, to, to the client. And then when the next request comes in, uh, even though it may be for the same connection, it may choose a different, different process. All right? 
So again, you're still relying on shared memory to make this all work. You're still relying on the operating system to do all your scheduling. Um, but in general, the, you don't have to fork things off every single time. You have a sort of the, this, this pool of resources or pool of processes you can, you can reuse as you need. So the only database system that actually I know that does something like this is uh, IBM DB2. Um, and we'll see in a second, DB2 actually supports all three process models. Um, that's because the system has to be designed to work on not only your sort of Linux and Solaris and your standard you know, Unix variants, but also like crazy mainframe stuff that has you know, architecture that was, uh, contains a lot of legacy components from like the 1960s and 1970s. So they basically let you as the DBA specify which one of these models you want to use based on what kind of hardware you're running on. So the last approach, which is it's the more modern variant of, of these three, is to do a single thread per worker. Right, so now we don't have multi-processes. We have a single process that has a pool of workers. Um, and when any request comes in, we just pick whatever we want in a pool and let it, let it execute. Right? And we can still do, you know, per connection, we could have a thread. We could have multiple threads run for the same, you know, for, you know, for different tasks with the same query. Right? It's really left to us to decide how we want to spread things out. So the disadvantage of this is that it requires more work on behalf of the database system developer. So people like us that actually work inside of the database system, we basically have to implement, re-implement a lot of the stuff, a lot of the scheduling architecture that the operating system will normally do for us if we're using the, the process model, right? But that's better because we can have now more fine-grained control on exactly how we want to organize and schedule tasks in our threads, right? And so for this, you may or may not have to use a dispatcher thread. So a dispatcher thread would be like a coordinator that says the request comes in and assign it to a, uh, to, to a, a free thread. As you, the paper you guys read in Hyper, they don't actually use a separate thread. They let all the workers do cooperative scheduling. Um, but in other systems, there could be a thread that organizes things out. So of course, DB2 does this because DB2 does everything. The newer versions of Oracle, I think as of Oracle 12, which I think came out, uh, what, two years ago, does this kind of uh, threading now. SQL Server does this, MySQL does this, and pretty much, as far as I know, every single database system that's been come out in the last six, seven, eight years is all going to do multi-threading. Nobody does the process model anymore because it's just a pain in the ass to deal with shared memory. Okay, so as I said, the, the, the multi-threading architecture has a distinct advantage over the other guys. Uh, one key aspect of it is that when you have a context switch from one thread to the next, it's much more lightweight than a context switch when you when in a, a process model. Because switching from one thread to the next in the same address space or in the same process, you don't have to switch security contacts, you don't have to you know, swap out program counters and things like that. It's not as big, or you have to swap program counters, but you don't have to swap out as much as you would if you're swapping out threads versus swapping out processes. We don't have to deal with shared memory anymore, which is kind of nice. Um, and in general, this is, it allows us to be more flexible in, in our architecture. This is, in my opinion, this is the better way to go. I'll, I'll note that just because, though, we're doing a one thread per worker, it doesn't mean we're going to be able to do intro query parallelism that we'll talk about in a second. So in the case of MySQL, for example, MySQL is a multi-threaded database system. But when you execute a single query, it's one thread will execute that entire query. Right? You can't split it off into multiple threads and combine the results as we can in, in the hyper paper. And in the case of like Postgres, you know, they could do multi-threading within a single process, even though they're using the process model, but they don't. Supposedly in Postgres 9.6 or 9.5, they're going to have multi-threaded queries, but it's still going to be forking off a single process. And then within that process, you can have multiple threads. They're not going to switch to the, the threading process model. And as I said, I don't know of any database system. You'd be crazy to build something with the process model now. Uh, when P threads are so widely available. So the only systems that I know that you could say there are newer ones that are, that are not doing threading are ones that are based on like Postgres. So Citrus DB, the Vitiza DB guys, they're predicated on, on using Postgres as architecture, but they didn't, they didn't rewrite it in the same way we did in Peloton to make it multi-threaded. Okay, so given that we have now a process model, now we want to think about how we're actually schedule these tasks for the execute queries. So for each query plan that comes in, uh, you can, usually what happens is you have a, um, you could assign the, the connection to a thread, and then that thread will do the parsing, the planning, and the optimizations for the query, right? Or you could have a central thread that do it. It doesn't really matter. But now we have a query plan, and now we have to decide where do we want to execute, execute it, when do we want to execute it, and how we're going to execute it. 
So these are some four general questions that we have to deal with. So we have to figure out how many tasks we should split up our query plan into um, and how many cores we can use to execute th those tasks. Right? It doesn't necessarily have to be a one-to-one -one matching. If you have 10 cores, it doesn't mean you have to use 10 tasks. Right? You, could, you could use less, you could use more. But then we also have to decide where should we execute these tasks. Right? And this will make a big difference in when we talk about the, the NUMA architecture because the access speed of data, the latency of accessing data at one CPU socket versus another is not completely, not always the same. So you want to make sure that if you know data is at this one location, you want to access, you want to run your query or tasks on data, on, on the cores that are closer to it. And this is the same thing we see in like a distributed database system, right? If you have your data across a bunch of nodes, you want to execute the query on where the data is actually located. You don't want to pull the data to, to the query. And then the last thing we got to deal with is where do we actually store the output, right? So all of this is kind of stuff we, you completely gloss over in an intro course, right? You just say, hey, here's a query plan, here's your processor, just plow through it, right? But now when we actually implement the, these things, we actually have to care about this, and it's not easy. And in general, I would say that the main, the main for the precept you should keep in mind going forward for the rest of your life is we never want to let the operating system do this, right? We, the database system is always going to know better, and it can always make better decisions. It's more work for us to implement this logic in the database system architecture itself, but that's okay because we get paid a lot of money to do it, right? Um, and it's sort of like the same thing. And I said never use MMAP, never let the, the operating system manage your, 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 your memory. You want to never let it manage, you never want to let the OS manage your, your scheduling. All right, so there's two types of parallelism we're going to want to, want to achieve in order to get better performance in our system. So the first is sort of the obvious one that we've talked about before when we talked about concurrency control. We want to have what's called inner query parallelism. And the idea here is that we want to improve the overall performance of the database system by allowing multiple queries to execute simultaneously. So we have multiple application threads invoking transaction requests, and we get this query request at the same time. We want to be able to have our database system execute those things uh, at the same time, right? And rather than then having to wait one after another. And so this is, where the, the, this is why we use that concurrent control stuff we talked about before. It's because we're going to allow these, these queries to execute simultaneously and not mess up each, each other and still maintain the illusion uh, that they have comp complete control of the system. They're running in isolation. So I would say that uh, you know, there's not much more we can talk about today in scheduling for concurrent control because we've already sort of handled that before, right? All the same ideas that we'll talk about you know, fit just, just along, you know, just as with everything we'll talk about here. Um, I will note that I don't, in my opinion, I don't think it's any, there's not a significant software engineering difference in the amount of work you're going to have to do to implement a concurrent control scheme uh, in the different process models. So again, Postgres is doing MVCC, it uses shared memory to make that work. I don't think there's anything much more work or less work you'd have to do if you switch to a multi-threaded architecture, right? I, don't, I think it's, I think there's no difference in terms of inner query parallelism, but I think there is a difference for intra query parallelism, which is the second time, type, type of parallelism we want to have. So for this, the idea is that we'll have a single query from one transaction, ignoring other queries running at the same time. We're just dealing with this, this one query. And we want to be able to improve the performance of the system by allowing us to run the tasks that correspond to that query plan for that query to run in parallel. Right? Instead of saying, like in MySQL, for a single query plan, we'll have one thread execute it from beginning to end. Now, since we have all these multi-core systems, we have all these extra threads we can use, we want to break up our query plan into tasks and allow cores to compute those tasks at the same time. So there's two approaches to doing intra-query parallelism. Right? So it's sort of the same way that you can have intra-query parallelism within that. We, uh, we can have another hierarchy to have the different kind of parallelism we can have in the operators themselves. So we can have intraoperator parallelism and interoperator parallelism. So interoperator parallelism, the idea is that we're going to decompose the different operator instances that perform the same function into sort of replicate them multiple times and have them operate on different segments of the data, right? So if you have a scan operator that wants to scan an entire table, we can split that scan operator into pieces and have the different instances operate on just those pieces. And that can be all being bl blasted that out in parallel. And the other type of parallelism is to do within, a, uh, within the query plan itself, we want to have the different operators at, at different levels in the, in the, the plan uh, 
execute at the same time. Um, so they're doing different functionalities, but they're both operating at the same time, and then we can feed data from one operator to the next and have that second operator compute whatever it is you need to compute on the output of the previous guy, but then the previous guy can still keep on running. So we'll show examples of both of these in a second, in the next slide. All right, so this is intraoperator intra, intra parallelism. Here's our query plan. We're doing a, a join between A and B on some foreign key, and then we have the uh, two predicates to do some kind of uh, comparison to filter out for both of the, the tables. And then here's sort of a logical plan, uh, query plan for this. Right? We do a scan on A, apply them to a filter operator, then we do the join, and then we have our projection. So say we start with this scan on A. Say A has you know, a million tuples, or, and we can divide it up into three, three different chunks of data. And so in our physical plan, we'll have separate operator instances that each operate on uh, a portion of the total data for A. So we'll break it up into three chunks or three partitions, and then we have an operator instance for those three chunks. And then we can assign them to cores at the same time, and they can execute them in parallel. And then now we can sort of expand it even further. We would see that, well, the scan on A immediately uh, sends its output into a filter operator. So what we want to do is, in our task, we want to assign not only the scan on A on, the, on, on some portion of partition of the data, but then also apply the filter operator. So this is essentially here is, is our task that we can then schedule out on these different cores. And then because we know we're going to do a, a hash join, then we want to go ahead and build the hash table that we're going to need to do the probing and do the join later on. And the way that we're going to be able to combine these results is through what's called an exchange operator. So there was a, a query optimization protocol or, or method in the 1990s, 19, late 1980s, for this system called Volcano. And they basically proposed a way to do parallel execution of query plans through these exchange operators. So what's going to happen here is because you know, this task here is doing a scan on A1, this one's doing a scan on A2, they're all, they're all building their own little local view of, of the table. And then we need some way to be able to combine them together to produce a single answer to then push it up into other parts of the, of the query plan. So this exchange operator is a way to sort of coalesce the results from these separate tasks and to combine them into a single piece of data that can then be used by other parts of the query plan with, without having to know that it was broken up to three separate tasks. So as we go along, the upper portions of the query plan don't know that we executed this in parallel and it doesn't care. right? So normally what happens if you execute this using like the iterator model, when you execute the, when you get to the exchange operator, as you go down the query plan, you would call fork or, or, or spawn to fire off these three, three separate tasks in separate processes or threads. And then it knows that it has to wait until all the output from those three processes or three threads finish before you notify the guy above you to say that I have the data that you were looking for. And now we'll do the same thing on B. Say B is a smaller table. It doesn't have as much data as A. So we'll just split it up into two chunks. And then we have two tasks uh, that will do the scan, the filter, and build our hash table. And again, we have that exchange operator that tells us that we need to combine these results. So now we get to the join operator. And the join knows that it's going to take the input from the exchange operators. And then we can farm out the actual probing, the, the join operation itself, do, by probing the different hash tables into separate tasks as well. So now we have sort of five tasks on five CPUs here that we can fire off in parallel. Then we have to wait until the exchange operators finish up, because now we have our two hash tables that we can compute our join. And then once that's done, we can then schedule four different tasks that do the, the join on some portion of the, of the hash tables we built. And then there's an exchange that tells us we coalesce them and produce the final answer. Right? So this is called horizontal parallelism because within a sort of single uh, hierarchy or level in, in the query plan tree, we can have all the operator instances running in parallel. So this is very common. This is used in most database systems that support um, sort of par inter-query parallelism. Uh, they'll, do, they'll do this kind of exchange thing here. And you see this a lot, too, also in distributed databases is because the idea would be instead of running on separate cores, these are running on separate machines. You get the data from over the network to some location. You coalesce them, and then you feed them off to, to, the, to the next operator. OK, so now in interoperator parallelism,
the basic idea is that we want to have sort of a, you can think of each of these operators in our query plan as running in a separate, th a separate thread as a separate task, and they're pulling the guy below it to get the next piece of data. Right? Again, this is from the volcano model, uh, or you, know, you, sort of, you think of this as doing get next, get next on the guy below to get the next data. But instead of that being a, a, a blocking call, where you go, you know, you, this guy blocks while you're waiting for this. You could you could tell this guy I want more data, and then spin in a separate loop up here and wait till he pushes something up to you. So let's see an example here. So let's say we we deal with this join, right? This join is basically going to do a, uh, a a for loop on the outer table, for loop on the inner table, and compute some join, and then I'll call emit, right, to tell it that I have a new output and push it up to the guy above you. So now in our filter operator. This thing here is just spinning on some input queue, wait, waiting for tuples to come from this guy below. So you can think of this as sort of a, a blocking queue where you pull it and say, wake me up when you actually have something. This guy computes a join between two tuples, produces some output, emits it to the next operator. This guy gets woken up in his thread, and then he spins, does whatever it is that he wants to do, and then, it, and then pushes it up further up the, up the tree. All right, so this guy can just be you know, spinning nonstop trying to you know compute this join and this guy can do whatever it wants and, and once he has something to compute he wakes up and does it right so these two different tasks or these different loops are running in separate threads so this is kind of problematic because uh, now we need to potentially assign this guy to a core and this guy to a core and chances are this guy is going to be waiting for a long time uh, for this guy to actually produce something um, so this is kind of difficult to do, and this is, they don't do this in Hyper because they want to have a single worker per, per core, and you wouldn't be able to do this because this core would essentially be idle, just waiting for output. Um, so I don't know how many database systems actually actually do this approach. They usually do the in the, the intro operator parallelism. Okay. So I'm still being very hand wavy about everything we've talked about so far. And there's, all, there's more questions we have to deal with about figuring out what's the right number of workers to use in our query plan. How do you want to split things up in tasks? Do you want to use you know, the same number of tasks as we have as we have hardware resources? Does it depend on the size of the data? Uh, does it depend on what the actual operator is doing? So there's all these other questions we still have to deal with before we even decide how we actually you know, generate a physical query plan. So, there's, so I'm not going to give you, there's no sort of one right answer to say this is exactly how you're going to do this. right? I can only say here's the different design choices you have to consider when you actually would implement something like this, right? And you have to look at your app, you know, what kind of database applications you're trying to support, what the other parts of your architecture are like, and when you make decisions for this kind of stuff. So there's two things we have to now consider as well in, in, in our scheduling. The first is that how are we going to assign workers to our hardware resources, our workers to our, our CPU cores? So one approach is to use a single worker thread per core. This is sort of the same thing we saw in HDOR, where there was a single thread execution engine per CPU core, and that's assigned to a partition. And the way that they made this work efficiently is that they would set the affinity of the thread that was running at that core such that it would only run at that one core. So what I mean by that is, say you fork off a bunch of threads in your process, you can tell the operating system what cores you want those threads to run on, and which cores they're not, allow not allowed to run on. So you can do this by setting the, this, this call called scheduler set affinity, and basically you, you provide the operating system a, a bit mask that says, I, I want my thread that it's making this call to only run on, on these sets of cores, or just this one core. And you do this for all the other threads you have in your database system to tell them run on this core and not all these other ones. So what happens is the operating system only schedules to run there, so it sort of wakes up. And the idea is that as it spins and wakes up, it's always going to run at the same core. And therefore, it's going to have better cache locality because all the data that it accessed the last time it ran still may be in its CPU caches because nobody else is running on that same core. Another approach is to have multiple workers per core. And basically, the idea is that you can have a pool of workers, either for a single core or a socket or a you know, subset of the socket. And the idea is that by having multiple threads be able to run on our cores, we we're going to get better resource utilization because we don't have to worry about if one thread blocks, then that blocks all execution of that core. Right? There might be another thread that can come along and start doing useful work. 
This is sort of the same idea we saw in, in a disk-based system because they have to worry about stalling going out the disk. In our case, we may, we may stall for other reasons like the network or, um, or just, just because, you know, a cache miss or something like that. And the, the OS schedule will be able to put something else in its place and still use the hardware. So there's, there's a bunch of different approaches. And in this case here, you still use the, the set affinity because if you're pooling workers per core, you want to have them you know, sort of assigned to a subset of the cores. You don't want to let them run anything they want to run. The other architecture decision we have to make is how we assign tasks. There's two approaches to do this. Um, so it's, at a high level, they're somewhat the same. Um, but I mean, there's different things you can think about for each of them. So the first approach is use a push model where there'll be some central thread that looks at all the workers that are around, looks at the tasks that are available, and assigns the, those tasks to those workers, sort of pushing the work to them. Um, and then when the worker t gets the task, it wakes up, starts running it, and then when it's done, uh, it, uh, it notifies the dispatcher that, hey, I'm done, and, gets, and then it's told what the next thing it should do. The pool-based model is that the workers are going to always be looking in some kind of queue for the next thing to do, and it's going to grab that out, execute it on its own, and then when it finishes, it goes back and gets the next task. It doesn't actually tell anybody I'm done. It just goes and does, does it. Right? So in the hyper scheme and then in this HANA scheme we'll talk about at the end, they're using a pool-based model. Uh, I think a lot of the older systems are using a push-based model because they do static scheduling. OK, so going forward, regardless of what worker allocation or task assignment policy we're going to use, uh, it's going to be very important for us to make sure that we only operate on local data. I've talked about this earlier where I said that we want to make sure that our, when a worker gets a task, and that task is going to tell it to access some data, we want that data to be close by to it. Right? And this could be, again, on, we want it to be on the, the memory that's local to it, or memory that's close by. And again, in, in a distributed system, it obviously would mean like you want memory, that, you want the data to be on the machine that you're on. But it's the same idea. So this means that when it comes time to actually schedule and execute a task on behalf of a query, we want to make sure that we're aware of what the underlying hardware layout is for our, for, for our memory model. Right? And there's two basic, or there's a couple, but I only talk about two of them. There's two basic memory models we can have. The first is called Uniform Memory Access, or UMA. And this is the approach that was used in semestic multiprocessing systems uh, up until about 10 years ago when we switched to the NUMA model. Right, and so the basic idea is that, say you have four CPU sockets, and each of these CPU sockets will have its, its local cache, right? L1, L2, L3. And then there'll be a, a series of memory DIMMs up above that are connected together over a bus. So when a process running on, on say, this socket here wants to access memory location X, right, it would send the request up to the bus, and then it would get routed over to the location that had it. The reason why we say this is uniform memory access is because the cost or the latency of accessing item X at this dim here is going to be the same for all our sockets or all our processes running these different sockets. Right? You're always going to have to go through the bus. Right? And obviously there's the cache coherence protocol with this, this controller here that keeps everything all in sync, but we can ignore all that. Right? It's basically, again, there's this bus. Reading anything or writing anything is always the same for all of our processes. So then around 10 years ago, uh, they actually started implementing what's called the non-uniform memory access. So the idea of this has been around for a while. Uh, and there was some sort of boutique shops that had, pro or had systems you could buy that had this kind of layout. But now this is essentially what Intel pushes forward. When you buy high-end Xeons, multi-socket machines, you're going to get this, this architecture here. So now we see that the bus is completely gone. And instead, we have this interconnect uh, in between all the different processors. And we also see that we don't have a shared memory bank or shared locations of DIMMs for, for all our memory. Instead, we're going to have for each socket, it's going to, they're going to have a local, uh, a, a local memory bank or a local memory DIMM that it can use. And so what happens is, say that this, there's a process running the socket here, and it wants to access memory that's here, that's really fast because it's really close to it, right? sort of direct access to it. But if this process wants to access memory that's over here, that's managed by this, this DIM, then you have to send a message over the interconnect, go through this processor, and then get to the thing that you're, you're actually looking for. Right? Now we see why it's called non-uniform memory access, because 
the cost of accessing memory here is really fast. The cost of accessing memory here is, is slower. So even though it looks from a processor standpoint, or sorry, from a process standpoint, you look like you have this you know, giant chunk of memory right, that's all contiguous. But in reality, it's split up across all this different hardware. Right? So if you're not careful about how you organize your database in memory uh, and where you decide how to assign tasks to these different cores when you want to have intra-query parallelism, you may end up having queries running here that always have to access data over there. Now we're talking like you know, nanoseconds of access time here, but the, the, the difference is quite significant. And as we'll see in some experiments, uh, it makes a big difference if, if, if you're always able to access things local here. OK, so this idea of organizing the database in our storage and in memory is not new to it. Yes, sorry. So one question is that it doesn't necessarily even need to be uh, even if you just have a multiple stuff. And you don't want to transfer data from one cache to another unless you need to. So if you schedule the task, which basically. No, keep on, keep on. Yeah. So all I'm saying is the scheduling makes sense even if it's not. Yeah, so. Right, so his comment is that uh, it doesn't necessarily even need to be NUMA. Um, if you had something like this, uh, if you say had to, there's data that this guy had in his cache, say that all the tasks that have to access some piece of data are always ending up here. And then for whatever reason, I have a task that gets landed here that will, will modify data that this guy has in his cache, I have to pay a cache coherence penalty because anytime I, I update that location, it's going to have to go and validate the cache here. So there's sort of extra traffic to make all this work. So it doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, we, we don't have to be careful in a new architecture. We have to be careful in this architecture too, as well. But I think, I, in my opinion, the, the effects are more pronounced in the new architecture than the. They're more pronounced, but they're quite pronounced. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to get that. So like, if you have to do cache invalidation f for here, you, in order to avoid cache validation, you want to try to keep data that's always used together uh, located at, at a single CPU socket. because so any task that has used that data always gets executed here. But it's the, the same idea for, for both of them. OK, so this idea of organizing the, the database in storage is not new, and it's not uh, specific to uh, in-memory databases. So this is, this is this idea called data placement, where we're going to split the database up, and then we'll, we're going to organize it in such a way and keep track of where the data has actually been placed. And then we can use this information to make decisions on how we schedule our tasks. And so in the same way in a distributed database, where the database system would keep track of this node has this shard, this node has that shard, we could do the same thing in memory for here. So we could say the, the, the database system split up, this, this CPU socket and its local memory has that portion of the data, and this CPU socket and its local memory has that portion of the data. And then we make decisions about how we, we want to organize our, our scheduling operations. And so there's a command in Linux called move pages that essentially allows you to take some address, addresses in memory and move it to one of, these, one, of, one of these nodes or one of these CPU sockets. So essentially what happens is if you, if you call move pages and give it an address range without telling it to move it, it'll come back and say, this, this memory location is located at this socket here. Then you can go back and invoke it again and say, all right, we'll now move it to this other CPU socket. So you can have fine-grained control of where you actually move data around uh, in your database system. But this assumes that we're doing it after the data has been created, right? But what happens when we call malloc? in our database system, we want to allocate a new ch chunk of memory, where does the data actually go? Where would, you know, what will actually happen in our system? So assume we call malloc, and assume that the allocator, which runs in user space, it's not a, it's not a call into the kernel, the user space doesn't have a free page or a free block of memory they can give out to our, pro our calling process. So what would happen in malloc here? Yes, go, sure. Right, he's, yes, that's it. So everyone get that. So when you call malloc, nothing actually happens. Right, it doesn't go in the, doesn't, doesn't go in the kernel, actually does go in the kernel, uh, but it doesn't actually allocate the real memory. So what happens is it'll make a kernel call and tell it to, tell the operating system to extend the, the process's uh, data segment, right, the memory that's being used for it. Uh, 
But this is all just in virtual memory, and it's not backed by anything in physical memory. It's only until your process either does a load or store on that memory location you've allocated, does it actually get a page fault, and then go to the memory control and actually allocate physical memory. So now the question is, if I ma call malloc, right, and I allocate a, bunch, a chunk of space, where is that memory going to be stored? What, like what socket? Right, so let's say I, I malloc it, but I don't touch it. Then another thread in my same process running on another socket, he touches it. Does it land on the, the, the socket that malloc did, or does it land on the socket that touched it? Anyone take a guess? Right. Well, I, yes. So by default, yes, but you can also do interleaving as well. But so basically what happens is there's, so there's a bunch of different policies we can enforce. The operating system will enforce for us that tell us where this memory is going to show up. So the, I think the default is called first touch. Basically, whatever, whatever thread touches it, wherever that is, that's where the, the local memory will be, will be physically allocated. But there's also a command in called NUMA control that you can specify the policies that the operating system will use. So one of the policies could say, just interleave the data all throughout my different sockets, uh, so that way I, I avoid the worst case scenario. Right? So, I bring this up because we want to be careful now about how we uh, set things up and load the database and other you know, uh, buffers we need to process queries because we want to make sure that our tasks are operating on data that's local and they're writing to, to data structures that are local as well. That we're not going over the interconnect and updating or ca and doing cache invalidations to other sockets. So data placement is a big deal in, in databases. So in this graph here, I'm showing, this is from a, uh, a micro benchmark that was done by people at, at EPFL uh, using an uh, in-memory version of ShoreMT. And it's a simple workload where we're going to use four, th four worker threads that are just going to execute the TPCC payment transaction. And what I'm showing at the bottom is the, for these four groups, these are their different thread, thread layouts or the thread, worker thread assignments to the different cores. Uh, relative to where the data is. So all the data is going to be stored on the first CPU socket here, the one on the, this top corner. And then for the different groups, where the, red, where the red marker is, it tells us where the worker thread has been pinned to by setting the, its affinity. So in the case of spread, all four worker threads are running on different sockets. On a group, they're all running on the same socket where the data is. Under a mix, we have two of this first socket and two of the second socket. And the OS is letting the OS do whatever it wants to do, which is always a bad idea. And so what you see here is the grouping of uh, grouping policy by making sure that the data is executed, the worker threads are executed on the socket that has the data close to it, gets you the best throughput here. So just showing you're motivating you why you never want to let the OS do anything and why we want to be careful about where we assign sockets and where we store the data. This is why we keep track of the placement policy or keep track of where the actual pages are stored in memory in our catalog, and then we can use that to assign tasks to CPU sockets at runtime to make sure they're only accessing local data. So in this example, the, the, the performance difference doesn't seem very pronounced, right? Worst case scenario, we're doing about you know, 7,800 transactions a second, but now and then up here we're doing about 11,000. 11, 11, For this workload, the, the amount of uh, data access per transaction is, is quite small. Right? It's only maybe 10 or 12 queries, and they're all, each, one of them, each of them is only accessing one tuple. So it's not a lot of data being moved around, but you can imagine if you're doing an OLAP query that's scanning large table segments, large chunks of data, then the performance difference will be, is, is, becomes more severe. So again, never let the OS do, do your job. So the other thing I want to be clarified too is that uh, the partitioning policy of a database system or database is different than the placement policy. So the partitioning scheme defines how we're going to physically divide up our database and divide up our tables. And we can do this using like you know, range partitioning, hash partitioning. Uh, we can just do a round robin approach where we have, say, four partitions. We each you know, go one by one and assign tuples to them. Or we can also do partial and full replications. We can have, say, on a, on a, on a single socket, uh, we can replicate the same table across all the sockets. And this is different than the placement policy because the placement policy is it tells the data system where it should actually put the partitions after you partitioned it. So this is telling us now if I split my 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 I split my I do hash partitioning on my tables based on the primary key. And now I've got a bunch of buckets. The placement policy tells me where I put those buckets. So you do this and then you do this, and you need to keep track of both of them. Okay, so where are we at so far? <laughs> 
We have a process model that tells us whether we multi-threaded or multi-process. We have our allocation model, our worker allocation model, that tells us whether uh, how many worker threads we want for the harder resources that we have. Then we have our task assignment model that tells us we want to do a push or a pull. Then we have our data placement policy that tells us how we're going to organize the layouts of chunks of partitions of the database in memory. And of course, we always have a solid appreciation for the, uh, the CMU database group. Um, so now we can talk about how we create a set of tasks from a logical query plan. So this is now this is the physical task we're going to assign to our CPU cores and be able to execute them and run them in parallel. So to do this for OLTP queries is really easy because we probably don't want to use intra-query parallelism. Why? What's a standard OLTP query? Insert. Inserts one, yeah. Select star from table where ID equals primary, or primary key equals some value. Right? You're doing an index probe to go find one thing. You can't really parallelize the index probe. You can't parallelize the insert. Right? It's just go fetching this one thing and just doing it. So there's not much we can do for dividing up a query plan to multiple tasks for this. It's for the overlap queries is what we really care about. Right? The LTB stuff is where the current control allows us to get inter query par parallelism. Uh, and then the stuff we're talking about today is allows us to get intra query parallelism for the OLAP queries. So the sort of standard approach that a lot of systems use is what's called static scheduling. And basically the database system decides when it does the query plan, when it generates the query plan, of how it's going to divide things up in tasks. And the easiest way to do this is just to say, I have 20 cores, I'll have 20 tasks. And then poof, you just shove it out and then let the, the scheduler you know, execute them based on some order. Um, the, the call, it's called static because we're doing this before we generate any query plans. And we don't adjust anything based on how the actual query plan executes or, or based on what's actually running the database system at the, at the same time. And in practice, this actually works pretty well. Because um, it's, it's easy to implement, and there's not much extra metadata you need to keep track of while the query runs. And so this is what you see in a lot of, a lot of like, you know, MySQL and Postgres will do stuff like this. But then, then we get to what the hyper guys are proposing to do. And they're doing a dynamic scheduling, uh, dynamic scheduling of tasks where the database system can adjust how many tasks and how, many, how much hardware resources it's going to assign to the, execute the query plan while it's actually running. And it can adjust that, move, moving that up and down based on what the performance is of, of, the, of the query plan and based on what else is running in the database system at the same time. So in their approach, they're going to have a one worker thread per core. Um, they're going to use pool-based task assignment. And they're going to use round-robin data placement for these morsels. And the morsels are essentially just partitions. right? For whatever reason, they didn't want to call them partitions. Uh, and they, came, they didn't want to call it chunks or blocks and things like that. So they, they, they call it morsels, but it's the same thing. And we're not really talking about this in this class. We'll talk more about it on Wednesday. But their approach is to allow them to do uh, all the sort of standard operators you want to do, like hash join, sort merge join, sorting, and things like that, all in parallel very easily. And being, while being aware of the, the layout and the placement of data in a Numa architecture. So the, at the high level, what you're going to have is in, in Hyper is in, you're not going to have a dispatcher thread, because they're all going to do what I'll call cooperative decentralized scheduling. So there'll be these, work, there's be these queues of all these tasks that some you know, uh, query planner generates. And then the threads can go look in the queue and say, all right, this, this task is, wants to access data that I know is local to me. So I'll, I want to execute that task. Right? And then the idea is that once you're done, you, you put the result in some, some location that's close to you. And then you go back in the queue and find the next thing to do. Right? And they use a lock-free hash table to make sure that you, know, you don't have threads tripping over each other when they're pulling things out of the queue. Because obviously, you don't want two, two threads trying to, access, trying to execute the same task at the same time. All right, so let's look at a high level how things look out, or how things look. So here's our data table. And we want to first split this up into morsels. So I think they choose for each morsel is going to be 100,000 tuples. Uh, and this looks a lot like the row groups we talked about in SQL Server, right? Row groups, partitions, shards, it's all the same thing. And then for each of these morsels, they're going to assign them to, the, to, to one of the CPU cores or CPU sockets. And that when they load it in, they'll store it in the memory that's, that's close to the, to the core. So now we want to ex execute things. Say we have a, this query plan here. We generate all the tasks 
for, for it. Right? And this is the, they call these things pipelines. And the basic idea is that the pipeline is going to be the, the operator instances that can be run one after another using d data directly from the guy below it without having to get data from anybody, anybody else. So in this case here, the, the uh, filter, operator, uh, filter, filter operator instance can use data directly from the operator instance that generated that does the scan on A. It doesn't have to combine anything with anybody else, so you wouldn't combine them into a single task called a pipeline. So now we have, all, say in our example here, we have three cores. And the first thing we see that within the data for each core, this local data, we're going to have all the morsels that correspond to, that, that, that are, have been assigned to it. But then we're going to also have this buffer for local data. Now, this is where we're going to store the output of all the operators. Right? Instead of having like a global hash table that can be accessed by anybody else, it's all going to have these little sort of thread local storage that they can use and know that nobody else is going to try to write this at the same time. So therefore, you don't have to use any lashing or locking to protect this. Right? This is the same thing we saw in HStore, where every execution engine had its own uh, exclusive access to the data, and it didn't have to use any locking or lashing. So now, when we, want the, we want to start executing this query plan. We have our queues, and the queues are going to be, for each task in the queue, it's going to be annotated in some way that says, this task wants to execute on data at this morsel. And so each of these different threads will look into the queue, and they would say, all right, we want to do a first scan on A, and each of them will find the data that's going to access the, find the task that's going to access the data that it has local in, its, in this morsel storage. And so now, when it does the scan, it pulls data out of its, uh, its morsels, its morsel storage, and, and runs on it. And then when it generates the hash table, it'll store it in this local data storage. So now let's say, in this case here, uh, these first two CPUs, for whatever reason, the scan on their morsels runs faster than the third guy. So these guys finish, and now they can go back in the task queue and try to find the next things to do. And again, it would say, all right, well, I have some tasks on B here, and I know that I'm, I'm, I have morsels for, for B1, so I want to grab this. I have the morsels for B2, I want, I want to grab that. So now, then they execute on that, and then while this other guy is still running computing on the scan on A3. And this could be because we miscalculated the amount of work we were going to have to do. It could be that, for whatever reason, there was a, the OS stalled our thread. Right? It doesn't matter. We don't care. For whatever reason, this guy is running behind. So now let's say the first core here, he finishes up early, and it would notice that uh, the core 3 is still running slow. It hasn't finished its scan on A3. So now it can go up and say, well, there's this task to scan B3, and I know that data is stored over here, but I'll go ahead and steal it because I can't start executing the hash join part because we haven't finished the scan operators in the query plan. So in this case here, we'd have to pull the data from this guy's morsel storage over the, the CPU interconnect and then bring it into our, our memory here, and then we can compute the, the scan operator and the filter there and build the hash table. But the key is that when it writes out the hash table as it builds it, it writes it to its local data output. Right, and there's some catalog or some additional metadata that's tracking uh, in, in, in our system to say, if you need the hash table for this, for this morsel, I have it here. Right? And fin this all finishes up, and then it can do the, the hash join uh, you know, just as it normally would you know, by combining the different, um, the different hash buckets that are built by these, all these guys and producing the final output. So the... Key thing to understand about why they have to do that work stealing thing or the task stealing thing is that because they only have a single core per worker, right? If you could, if if each worker thread or each core could only operate on the data that on the morsels that it had local, the stragglers would slow everything slow everything down. Yes, the core that finished up early could look in the queue and try to execute the next query, uh, to try to execute the task for the next query, but Ideally, you kind of want to have the lowest latency as possible, so, it's, so it's, it's, we're willing to pay the penalty of cache invalidations and moving data over the interconnect by stealing the work from, from somebody else. We'll see in a few, few slides, when you actually scale up to really large so socket systems, like 32 sockets, they actually found that the work stealing thing doesn't, work, doesn't actually play out that well. But in the smaller uh, systems that they're using in the hyperpaper, this actually makes sense. And then they also use a lock-free hash table to maintain the global queues. We're not going to talk about that so much here. We'll talk about more of that on Wednesday when we talk about doing uh, hash joins. All right, so we'll spend some time in the beginning talking about different ty types of hash tables. So another alternative way to do uh, dynamic scheduling is a recent paper in VLDB 2015 from 
uh, the SAP HANA guys. So what I'm describing to you was, is how they do scheduling in this prototype or this one-off version of HANA. The actual real commercial version that you get when you, when you give SAP money doesn't actually do what we're talking about here, but you know, could be, because this could be something they would add in later on. So this, this type of newware scheduling is going to do pool-based scheduling, just like Hyper, but the difference is that they're going to have multiple worker threads that are allowed to operate uh, in groups on the same hardware cores, the same CPU cores. So each CPU socket can have multiple groups, so it doesn't necessarily mean to have one socket per, per group or one group per socket. And then when in each group, we're going to have two different queues that correspond to whether there are tasks that can be stolen or not stolen. So a soft priority queue would say that here's something that I'm, I, I want to execute this group, but if someone comes along and steals it, I'm okay with that. And then there'll be a hard priority queue that says no other thread group can steal this, this, this task and only can run at this socket. And different from what Hyper does is that we're gonna have, they're going to have a separate watchdog thread running in the background that checks all these groups and see whether they're, they're, they're fully utilized. And if notices that some, of that some of these threads are idle, it can go tell it to, to go steal tasks from the soft queue of another thread group. So there's, there's much more management we have to do in this than Hyper, because Hyper says you know, every guy is just always looking for, for, for the next job and just does it regardless of where the data is. Um, if there's nothing that can run that for its local data. In this case here, it's a bit more nuanced and there's a bit more sophistication required to do the watchdog thread. Um, the, I'm not going to talk too much about what they're doing on the inside, but I'll just say that the way that they're going to have multiple threads working in a single group together is that they categorize them based on what they're actually doing. So you could have a, a group of threads that are actively executing a task and you mark them as working, right? and then you could have threads that are blocked waiting for some latch to, to free up before it's allowed to do something. Then you have, can have a free and part threads. And these are sort of like a bullpen for the thread group to allow the, the watchdog thread to say, well, I see that you're, you're not fully utilized or you're, you have idle cores. So pull something out of the free queue or pull something out of the part queue and allow them to go steal work and start doing, you know, get, get better utilization by doing, doing work when they would otherwise be idle. So I'm being, I'll be real hand wavy about all this, but I'll just say that what they found in this paper is that it's better to have groups of, of threads and be able to move around what CPUs they're actually running on rather than having the sort of single, single thread pin per core. And they found that when you scale up to a large number of sockets, the work stealing approach that Hyper uses, it doesn't actually play out. Uh, and I think that our reason is just because at that level, there's, there's so much movement around that you saturate the interconnect with all these cache validations. And then the other thing is that I thought was kind of cool, in the, in the Hyper case, those worker threads can only execute queries. They can't do anything else. So you have, you have to assign additional threads to do logging, additional threads to do networking stuff. In the, uh, in the, the, the HANA model, because these, there's multiple threads per, per, per group, you could have some of the threads in the group do networking, some of the threads do other background processes, and overall the utilization become, is, is more uniform Right, then it's having sort of one of these CPU cores that are pegged at 100% all the time processing queries. And then other threads you allocate it for doing background stuff are only used some of the time. All right? Okay, so just to sort of finish up quickly, the, a database system is a beautiful piece of software, right? It's, it's doing everything, right? It's doing networking, it's doing logging, doing recovery, doing transactions, doing query processing. Uh, and the key thing is, in order to treat your database system right, you have to make sure that you implement the scheduling protocols to, take, to be fully aware of what the underlying hardware looks like. Because if, if you don't realize you're running on a NUMA system, or even, even the UMA system, if you don't track of where your data actually is, and you just let it access whatever it wants, then you're a software performance penalty. In the case of the Hyper paper and the HANA paper, the difference is quite, quite significant right? when you run OLAP queries. Um, and the main thing, again, always is never let the OS do the stuff the database system could do. Right? The database system always knows exactly what's going on and always knows more about what it's trying to do than the, than the operating system ever could. Right? To the operating system, your database process looks like anything else. Right? Yes, it may have a different access pattern, but it doesn't distinguish a database process between like, you know, a YouTube client or a, a, you know, a BitTorrent client or something like that. Right? The database system actually knows what it wants to do. It knows what it's going to execute queries, how it's going to execute queries, and therefore it can always make better decisions on how it organizes everything. Right? And this is because we have a declarative query plan, 
right? We have we use SQL. We know exactly what all the operators are going to do. We know what our, where our data is. You know what it looks like. So we can always make better decisions. Okay. Any questions about scheduling, and task execution? Okay. So here's another street lesson. So in 1997, uh, there was a, uh, a a noted laureate, Christopher Wallace, who came up with a list of rules about what you should do or how you should, you should um, maintain yourself when you're hustling on the street, right? And in particular, he was talking about how to deal crack, all right? Because in the early 1990s, crack was really big, and he was in Brooklyn and he was dealing crack on the streets there. He spent a little time in prison, I think when he was like 17, but he came out and basically wrote down and codified a bunch of rules that how, how you should do all this. So even though it's 20 years later, and even though that we may not be hustling the same way that, that, that Christopher did, a lot of these rules that, that he talked about are still applicable to us in the context of database systems. So I'm going to go through each of them one by one. So the first thing is that we want to never, never let, make sure that we never let anybody know how much money we're holding on ourselves, right? People get jealous, people get kind of weird, and so we want to avoid that entirely. So in the context of databases, you don't want people to know like how much money your database system is making, how much money your, your salary is at the company. You want to keep all that information private. Never thing is that we, he says, never let people know your next move. So if you're going to start, you know, move your trap from one street to the next, you don't advertise that ahead of time. In the same ways in the context of databases, if you're at one company and you think about moving to another, or you think about putting out a new, new feature that's going to beat, beat your, your, your competitors, you don't let people know this until it's actually done, right? You never want to trust anybody, right? So in the case of hustling on the street with your trap, you don't want people to know where your stash house is. You don't want people to know, again, where you're storing your money, where you're staying, right? In the case of databases, uh, it's a little bit less, uh, it's a little less vicious, so it's OK uh, to, to tell people where you're going, what you're doing. Um, but in general, you should be very mindful about what people's ulterior motives are, right? You keep everyone sort of at arm's length. Uh, never sample your own supply. Uh, in the context of, of dealing, obviously don't, don't dabble in your own product. In the case of database systems, I actually maybe I disagree with that this is actually apropos. Um, because obviously when you build a database system, you always want to try to eat your own dog food. So if you have a database system that you're building, you want to use that for as many internal products as you can. So I should maybe put a line through this one. You don't, you don't have to follow this. Uh, never sling where you live. Basically means if you're dealing, don't deal out of your house. Doesn't matter what, how much they want, they want from you. Uh, don't, uh, don't give them anything, right? Because this is just asking for trouble. Never lend anybody credit. Uh, if you think someone who, who is using is going to pay you back later, that's probably not going to happen. Uh, and the same thing in, in a database system. If, if you give people you know, free stuff and you expect them to pay you back later with you know, gifts or other things like that, it's probably not going to happen, so you want to avoid that. Uh, never mix your family with your business affairs. Uh, so that means don't try not to get, have your family involved in, in your, your trap or have people involved in your database company or database product, right? Sort of always, again, keep other people at arm's length. This is related to not trusting anybody, even though you're family. Because at some point, you may have to make a hard decision, and your family members may, may, may end up getting hurt. And it's just, it's just better to avoid that entirely. Uh, another thing is that you never want to keep a large amount of product on yourself, and this includes your car, your personal body, your house, because in general, this is just general good advice to have, right? Just don't, don't leave anything on yourself. Yes? Um, so for this kind of bit, Biggie says that instead of us holding weight, uh, them cats who squeeze your guns can hold jumps too. Yes. So I'm wondering what he meant by this. Okay. And also, like, what is a jump? Okay, so that's a good, that's a good question, Dana. So Dana asked, um, right, so he says that uh, the cats who squeeze your guns can hold jumps too. So a jum is a jumbo crack rock, usually like $20, $20, maybe a little bit more now, depending on what the street is. And the idea is that there's all these, uh, if you're dealing crack, there's all these uh, you know, laws that say you know, how much product you need to have in yourself before you go from sort of just, just holding it to, to distribution. So if you have a trap set up and you have a lot of product, you personally don't want to be holding all this because if you get caught by, by, by the police, 
then they might bust you on a federal charge for distribution. So all your sort of minions that are hanging around your trap that are sort of watching things, taking money, things like that, you want to let them hold all the product because if the police come, they'll take the fall. And if they're under, under age, they probably wouldn't be arrested in the same way that you would, right? So jump just means jump, jump over crack rock. OK, good question. All right, it uh, goes without saying, never talk to the police. It, just, it never ends well, so avoid that entirely. And again, in databases, the same thing, never talk to police. And then finally, uh, never take an assignment job if you don't have the clientele. So if, if someone wants you to sell their product, if you don't think you can push it in a reasonable amount of time, you don't want to do that because they're going to come back and say, where's my money, right? Same way in a database job, if someone says, hey, I have this big customer, I need you to come you know, use your database system or, or build some ex extra feature for it, if you don't think you can, you can do this and complete it in, in, the same, in a good amount of time, it's probably best not to take the job because people just end up getting upset. OK? So again, all of these things, these are all rules that I follow in my life. And I, I strongly encourage you to do the same, because it got me to where I am today. OK, so uh, next class, we're going to talk about parallel hash joins, the multi-core hash joins. And so I'll spend some time in the, in the beginning talking about different types of hash tables, lock-free hash tables, cuckoo hash tables, things like that. And then as a reminder, for project number two, next Monday, Joy will announce that we'll do a checkpoint. And the basic idea is a casual thing that you just meet with him, discuss your code, um, if there's any questions you have about how to implement things, he can sort of help that out. And then just make sure that everyone's sort of making progress and moving along. Okay? In the back, yes. What happened to Chris? Christopher Wallace. Um, unfortunately, he got shot in 1997. Uh, actually, his, the memorial's coming up. I think it's next month. It's like March. He was shot on March, March 9th, 1997. So it's almost a month from today. Which we know we could have a moment of silence for, for it in the class. But since it's the spring break, we're to, we can't do that. So... Um, <laughs> Any other questions? All right, see you guys on Wednesday.